Thank you so much for that introduction, Christy. I think um, the biggest realization I just had is five years that I spent here, I have spent five years out and the, the math was not adding up in my head right now, I realized, but I feel like that's a post-pandemic kind of mathematical conundrum we're all in. But um, what up, Sayark? <laughs> It's been a hot second. Um, I mean, I was just here in the summer with DID, um, and I too have been doing a little bit of, uh, I don't know, I've been in my feelings a little bit, right? I, it was, I was a part of the DID program here at SciArc, that's how I encountered architecture, um, in 2011. I was a junior in high school, 2011 or 2010. It's been now at this point 10 years, I think, and, I uh, was a junior in high school um, sitting in a classroom in the Santa Clarita Valley thinking about what would come next, if college was even possible, you know, like junior year is like a crunchy, crunchy college time. You start to think about the future, right, if, if college is going to happen, if it's not going to happen. And uh, I remember a strange man walking into our classroom and talking about how Los Angeles was just like a pen because both of these things are about design. They've both been designed. And I was just sitting there and that was Darren Johnstone. So, <laughs> yes, yes, who, you know, really was, was my, my first teacher here. So shout out to, to Darren and to that, to that moment that feels, you know, a little especially fresh for me tonight. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in a little bit into a maybe, uh, I'd like to start off the conversation tonight with a little bit of a disclaimer or definitions or maybe kind of setting the terms of how I want to talk about things tonight. Um, and I think the first is in, in some way an acknowledgement of feelings, right? And I think that that introduction and maybe just thinking right now about memory and being here in the past and what it means to be here again, the kind of feelings of coming back home, who is here, who has been here, and because of whom are we here are all on my mind. So, you know, the first thing is just to say thank you to all of you. Um, thank you to everyone who made tonight possible, who made my education possible, um, who has made that path possible for me. And, you know, high amongst that list is also a big thank you to, to my family. Um, and my sister who's here tonight, and the people who um, in a lot of ways gave me the strength to keep going through my education. And um, amongst that family are also educators, friends, um, people who are here and who are not here tonight, but a, a big thank you. Um, so in those good feelings are also, you know, a lot of other feelings. Um, I think in the past couple of years, maybe we've all encountered this feeling that's on the, the word is on the, on the wall tonight, right? Um, rage, and, and I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that before we get started, right? So, um, landscapes of rage, tonight is gonna be a little bit of a stream of consciousness. It's gonna include some dreams, some nightmares, some projects, some conversations, some things that I've taught, some things that I've been thinking about. Um, and I've been, really sort of um, trying to find a way to describe this energy that I've sort of been existing in for five years. Um, it, and it's really great that we kind of start off with those five years, that, that metric maybe in some ways is, is kind of interesting, that temporal metric. It's been five years and some of those years have been lived and operated within, or we could even say kind of practiced within, in very different conditions, right? Um, that time being a time of political upheaval, a time of biological um, uncertainty, um, a time in which a lot of the ground upon which we maybe have been standing or maybe even that we felt comfortable on suddenly shifted or felt entirely liquid beneath us. And, and I think in those moments, you kind of have a couple choices to make, right? And I bring up the word rage because it has a really interesting history. So, you know, uh, when I think about this word rage, for me, it maybe brings up a little bit of its kind of past usage. So, 
And again, I'm in, not again, but maybe for the first time tonight, I'll admit I'm no linguist or in any way kind of, you know, uh, not a, a true sort of um, <laughs> um, deeply knowledgeable person about the origin of words. But, you know, the 13th century origin of the word rage comes from ragen, which means to romp or to play. And that definition is completely obsolete. Um, and once we enter the kind of 14th, 15th century definition of the word, rage begins to take on a different form, which is no longer about play or about romping. And romping exists somewhere between really play and kind of wandering or almost kind of lumbering, right? Um, it begins to then mean something else, which means to be filled or to be compulsed by agitation. And I want to think about that word, and, and maybe we can think about all of this work and the things that we'll see on the screen and the things that we'll hear as maybe both a, a form of agitation, a kind of agitation within systems, but also a state of being agitated. And I think that that's something that I fully believe in, um, to accept one's feelings of agitation, right? Whether that means to be uncomfortable, to feel... Um, strange, as you know, kind of Chrissy brought, brought this up a little bit, to be a stranger in a strange land, to be within systems, but also feel a discomfort within them and acknowledge that and work in that space, right? To work within, uh, to work in a state of agitation and to agitate. So I, I want to think about rage in, in that term. And to me, you know, I think, uh, um, being agitated, right, or why one is agitated maybe is sometimes um, takes a back seat to what we do with that agitation um, or what we do with those feelings, what we do with those emotions, and in this case, what we do with that rage. Um, but to also think about different states of being. So, you know, I also um, kind of invoke a bit of Fred Moten to kind of live in that space of thinking about rage, thinking about emotions and feelings and I think um, to also be in the face of a kind of agitation that sometimes maybe feels sort of impossible to escape from, I want to also acknowledge the fact that to be in rage can also be an act of romping, to be a place of play. And sometimes it's, it's a choice. And I think often I've tried to take the route of finding play within those spaces. So um, I'm gonna jump in um, with a short video. The video will have kind of snippets of work that I'll talk later on. Some things we'll maybe talk about later, some things we won't, but I'll kind of start there and sort of let you guys um, just listen and, and kind of look at some stuff. You don't know your neighbors, you don't know who lives above you, below you, around you, next to you, whatever. I always learned I was lucky. I was lucky, I guess, you know. We lived in condos, we lived in, I lived in a small house for a little bit, you know, with my. Um, 
was the first time in time I really like that because when I was like 27, um, you know. A friend of a friend of a friend fucking hooks up at a fucking flat to parents. You know? First story will begin in 2020 in Texas um, with a job. On a hot June night, I arrive in Marfa, Texas after five long hours on the road. The heat doesn't let up at night in Texas. It was late past midnight. I found a note and a key under a doormat of the Adobe house where I would be staying, a house renovated and cared for by someone we will call the local architect, who has based his one-man practice in Marfa for more than 10 years. His office sits nestled on the second floor of the First United Methodist Church. I had driven across Texas to come work with the architect for the summer on a mixed-use project in what is, by all accounts, a vicious real estate market in residential Marfa. I had been here once before, and it doesn't take many visits to understand what the place is all about. Cafes sell $7 Mexican lattes and crystals. As I enter the house, I was greeted by a bright red poster from the local glamping spot. Their eye, a logo, stares back at me. I laugh, it's almost too fitting. The architect's house is a popular Airbnb rental in the area, and much of the interior has been prepared for this particular reason. I spot Native American blankets draped across couches, mortar and pestle in the kitchen, the same crystals from the shop are religiously set on library shelves. But upon closer inspection, 
I fish out from behind some books, a small whip made of carved bone and human hair. Above the dining room table, a goat's head is mounted. Above the front door, a bundle of herbs. In bed later that night, I think about these things for a long time. I think about the fine line between hipster desert collections of artifacts and the occult. This line begins to feel quite thin. An absurd thought begins to enter my mind. I try to shake it off, but I can't quite rid myself of it. I spend the next four to five hours in bed thinking. Around three in the morning, my anxiety has begun to reach an extreme. It begins first with a confession. I am a young brown woman in the middle of Texas in what is slowly unfurling and what we did not know yet was to be a global pandemic. And secondly, I begin to think about Martha, Texas and whether or not I've come here a sacrifice. I begin to think a little bit more about this. Somewhere in between that thought, I enter a place between thinking and dreaming. I'm in the desert. How many lives have been lost here already and are continued to be lost every year crossing the Chihuahuan Desert? I remember stories recalling that passage and the literal sacrifice that happens in the dirt between, the Mexico, between Mexico and the US. It is in this moment that I recall my first ever experience of Donald Judd's 100 aluminum, aluminum boxes. Donald Judd moves to Marfa in 1971, buys 16 decaying buildings, an entire decommissioned army base, and three ranches spread across 40,000 acres and begins one of the greatest art complexes the art world has ever seen. Standing in that artillery shed before his 100 aluminum boxes, I suddenly come to realization that they are silent, but that there is something piercing, something loud, something staring at me. Now, at this point, I am probably drenched in sweat, but I'm deep in the fever dream. In the dream comes the immediate realization of Donald Judd's and the world of commercial art created in Marfa to which he belongs and its collusion to violence. I notice there's beating upon the boxes, condensation, the beating of blood. Over the next month, I work in Marfa and I think about those boxes. Something is stirring from within. Something is stirring from within and the feeling does not leave me. Over the next month, um, I spent some time in Marfa working on, on two projects. The first project began after um, this dream that I may or may not have had and that may or may not be true. Um, and the, the first kind of initial sense when I came to Marfa was a, a sort of understanding that the kind of art world that exists there is one where commercial and intellectual value have created an abundance of wealth that is neither directed, controlled, utilized, or welded by Latinx, Mexican, or indigenous people. This made me angry. It made me question things. It made me a bit scared being alone in this place in the middle of the summer by myself, having told no one that I was taking a job in the Chihuahuan Desert. So I arrive there and I have these thoughts and I spend the next, um, you know, a couple of nights under the full moon with a, a photographer who also made the trip and, and we spent some time making a video of these buildings. Um, so Donald Judd bought, bought 16 buildings in Marfa. He, uh, the state no longer owns most of those. Some of them sit abandoned, some of them are open to the public and of course during COVID they were all closed. Marfa itself was essentially abandoned. Most of the kind of systems of tourism that um, are usually activated in Marfa were completely shut down, leaving a kind of local condition of extreme precarity, right? No local hospital, 
um, underfunded and under um, sort of utilized infrastructure um, or infrastructure that was sometimes not even present where it should be. And amongst so much wealth um, in incredible crisis, right? So I, I kind of spent um, a couple of days sort of digesting that. And before I could even dig into anything, just spent some time uh, making this. So um, many thanks to, to photographer Brooke Holm for the, you know, we spent some time shooting images in the dark with some like gel filters over car lights um, <laughs> and using a full moon to sort of shoot these buildings. And, and I think, you know, in this video at the beginning, um, you may or may not have noticed um, in the sort of vertical um, video that balloon is a surveillance balloon that's right outside of out, out, right outside of Marfa right so Marfa sits on the border between Mexico and the US um, simultaneous to the to the sort of wealth and and kind of operations of sort of art world um, kind of constructions and the mythology of Donald Judd's work um, is also the reality of this place, right? And, so, you know, you can hear the kind of undulations, the sort of sirens, um, things and patterns and rhythms that, that begin to kind of appear in the soundscape. Um, in a lot of ways, I think surveillance and vision have a lot to do with this place. Um, and really, it was like almost a kind of subconscious sort of exploration of things that I, I didn't really know yet. Um, so I spent the next month um, and uh, many hours in the Presidio County Museum archives, which is a room of a lot of stuff <laughs> belonging to Marfa and, and parts of West Texas. Um, and I didn't really know what I was looking for, right? I had been invited there to work with um, architect Chick Rayburn on what we were thinking of as um, a future architectural residency to be developed on a residential lot. Um, but there were all these it questions in my mind about this place, right? So I just dug through stuff and, and tried to think a little bit more about what this place was. And I think, you know, in some ways, I think um, as we ask the question of what is this sort of art world construction, so were many people kind of thinking, um, uh, what is this when Donald Judd sort of moved to Marfa? And alongside what was really a kind of active constructing another reality on top of an existing reality. Um, we're also sort of all of the sort of mythologies and stories that we tell about that, right? And the histories and narratives that exist before that even arrived. So in, um, in sort of, you know, ex exploring the history of, Mar of Marfa emerges a much more complicated and I think um, very sort of rich history of not only landscape, um, political writing, rewriting, and constant sort of um, blurring of borders, 
um, but also patterns of both people, animals, and materials, right? So um, Marfa not only has a kind of history of, of cattle um, and, and different sort of agricultural uh, flows, um, Marfa also was the, the base to, um, you know, uh, different sort of phases of army encampments and bases, one being the, the large army base that Judd later purchases. Alongside um, a pretty kind of really, really kind of unspoken but very present history of the Buffalo Soldiers in that area. So in um, the Buffalo Soldiers being a group of soldiers that were primarily African American sent to the border to fight Native Americans or to kind of fight to keep the border of the US intact, right? Um, leading to also a series of residential spaces in Marfa that were owned by the Buffalo Soldiers, of which there is no clarity um, anymore where their lineage stands in that space. So forgotten histories, um, histories that are still present in some of the structures that, be, that have survived, I think, for, throughout the, the, the kind of history of Marfa, and then a, a history of land um, an environment and space that runs through all of that, right? So a lot of these images kind of really um, helped me to kind of think a little bit more about this space. And ultimately, I really got kind of obsessed with two, two sort of realities here. One was the kind of army history, one that is of violence, one that is of personas of violence um, being soldiers and most predominantly the idea of the cowboy. Um, and rodeos, right? Rodeos being a place where animal and performance, um, labor and performance begin to converge. So rodeo structures and structures for keeping, herding, and tending to animals were one of the sort of predominant um, structures that first arrived in Marfa, followed closely by um, the sort of order and uniformity of the army base. So these two things are sort of in the subconscious of a, a lot of the structures that even exist there to, today. Um, the project that kind of came out of that summer was the Ordenar Rodeo House um, on Ordenar Street. Ordenar means to order. Um, there was something kind of interesting in that kind of uh, the space of that word sort of being present. Um, and a lot of the project um, dealt with the small residential lot in the middle of the kind of fraught reality of what it means to build anything in Marfa, which is a crazy kind of um, difficult <laughs> uh, thing to maneuver. Um, but this was our site. Um, in the center, a foundation of what used to be um, a small space for tending to animals, a small house for someone to live to tend to animals, um, and some uh, water features, water troughs, and a lot of plants. Um, and in this project, you know, there's a kind of simple move to take that found that square footage or the, the kind of footprint of what used to be there and turn it into a communal um, arrangement of resources for what would be um, a future architecture residency in the space. So the idea would be that there would be four people living here in the center, a kind of uh, convergence of resources. So a, a space to collectively wash, uh, collectively cook, um, a place where fire also heats up a small bathhouse and um, steps for listening to or engaging in, in communal activities like listening to each other or staging sort of performances against um, a, a wall that becomes the, a kind of backstage to different activities. Um, so, you know, this, this sort of being a kind of play on, on the things that existed there and I think pulling from their histories to think about how layers can begin to accumulate, right? So uh, this was one of the bathhouses on the site. Um, these are some images of, of kind of proposals for what an artist studio might be kind of growing and building slowly over time rather than building all of the structure at once and thinking about spaces that are, you know, unbuilt or slowly built rather than a kind of, um, you know, quick build or um, fully built project. Um, and thinking really about the kind of uh, spaces of, of kind of tending 
keeping um, animals moving, animals moving bodies, right? And, and sort of the ability to begin to kind of disrupt those things and think about how performance and play um, begin to sort of converge. Um, you know, th that project, you know, I, I wanted to kind of start there because Marfa's maybe the, the most recent project where things kind of became architectural fairly quickly. Before that, um, I was doing mostly a lot of seeing and thinking. Um, in 2019, I, I went to the Arctic Circle as part of the Arctic Circle uh, Research Science and Art Expedition. Um, an expedition that happens bi-yearly with a crew of both scientists and artists um, to ponder and really explore different issues of ecology, um, climate issues, and um, infrastructural change in the Arctic region. Um, and when I went there, I really didn't know what I was looking for necessarily. I was interested in, in thinking about the imminent infrastructural change that would come to the site and yet I didn't know what I would find there. Um, and I wanted to kind of shift to that because in Marfa, maybe I kind of showed a little bit of like archival digging. The next projects are gonna be a shift away from that. In the Arctic is really the place where I began investigating site and thinking about place through the collection of sound and video. And this really becomes a kind of uh, way of working for me collecting and through seeing, or in some ways even kind of the, the distance that the camera sometimes brings and that collection itself of audio and video bring, um, is one that I think becomes very productive, but also is very much embodied and is about the body and senses. So when I went to the Arctic, this is in Pyramiden, which is, was a previously Soviet um, uh, occupied space in the Arctic, the last Soviet occupied space in the Arctic. Um, and it is currently undergoing massive uh, construction efforts to produce a uh, Soviet Disneyland for future tourism in the Arctic Circle, which is at this point, um, you know, 30 years out are some of the projections for starting, you know, patterns of, of tourism traffic into this region, which was previously. Um, very difficult to reach. So, um, you know, it, it, it kind of begins there, the sort of story of, of collecting sound video to begin to, to kind of know more about a place. Um, I wanna dive into the, this next story. Um, this is in 2020 as well. I started teaching at Texas Tech and um, I launched the Bunker Studio as a, an option studio for, for undergrads and when I, moved there, I knew of a tornado that had hit Lubbock, Texas, um, and a kind of a history of, of storm shelters being a thing. And if I didn't know it, I certainly knew it when I encountered these on the, you know, roadside. Um, but it made me kind of dig a little bit more into that, and I immediately uh, found this. So the studio structure centers itself around um, the 1968 city of Lubbock planning department and the Department of Defense's collaboration on a community fallout shelter plan for the city of Lubbock. Um, and this is right around the same era of, of kind of widespread par American paranoia of nuclear war, right? And the nuclear shelter becomes a very real kind of domestic addition um, that many people are, you know, not only beginning to think about, but we see it pop culturally, we see it in the mainstream of a lot of American media. But um, these handbooks were made for Lubbock citizens to begin to not only speculate, but prepare for a master plan to be built in their town. Right around that time, in hand in hand with the Department of Defense's collaboration is also the architecture of Lubbock handbook, the styles handbook for architecture in Lubbock. Um, and it's uh, essentially a guide for identifying and preserving architecture. It really, it's a kind of guide to different um, names by which you might call a building. Um, and this became really interesting for, for us as a studio to begin to think about looking back at the city in which we were living and thinking about architecture and how can we dive into some of that history um, quite literally, dive into it 
under the ground and kind of investigate it. So we used the downtown Lubbock master plan for um, shelters. Not all of these shelters were built. Many of them were. Many of them still exist under Lubbock. Um, many of them are under Texas Tech University still, and you can access them. And a lot of them have been, have been also filled. So for the studio, it became really interesting for us to think about some of the very real realities of, of um, tornadoes and, and kind of weather um, uh, sort of disasters and things that have happened, a kind of history of that in the town, but also the kind of mythology of the space beneath, right? What's beneath the world around us? And so um, we spent some time, every student was kind of uh, chose one of these sites, which by the way, are spread all around um, Lubbock from the university out into different neighborhoods. They were um, supposed to be built under houses, under schools. They're really kind of everywhere and, and, and don't really stick to any one kind of typology. So the students spent some time building models. They spent some time thinking, going to sites, talking to the owners of these buildings, and then built these really big models, and, and our studio is going to be all about building huge, you know, kind of um, models and, and looking at these buildings from the outside and beginning to investigate. So a lot of interviewing um, local residents of Lubbock, people who had lived there um, or even had heard of some of these things, um, and, and trying to kind of gain access, right, via sort of literal investigation and asking questions and thinking. Um, then the pandemic uh, came about and we evacuated the building wow. and we evacuated the building and we had to leave the models behind. So this is what came about from that shift. Wow. seeing some of the locations and sites where, where bunkers were to be located um, and other sites that some students picked as possible places where they felt bunkers could or should exist. I'll kind of uh, pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so we kind of shifted a little bit for a studio that was really sort of set out to be a kind of a forensics archival exercise. We had to shift our um, methods, right? We were all sitting individually at home, talking to each other and shifting this, this sort of um, engagement to the screen. So we began to activate the section, right? Animation began to really be a way for students to explore that movement from above to below. And we also had to sort of shift some, uh, some of our methods in, instead of analysis and investigation to speculation and dreaming about the things that maybe could exist below the world around us, right? Um, Lubbock in many ways revealed itself to be a town 
that in the face of many of these paranoias still held the traces of not only that paranoia and anxiety, but of the mystery of that um, architectural language of the bunker. So, you know, the kind of blank facade became in some ways a kind of um, interest for the studio, um, wanting to dig below the surface, wanting to think about the things that could exist below the surface was really a way to enter speculation. And to move away, I think, from um, some of the sort of embedded um, defense language of, of the bunker. So in the videos that, were, that you saw earlier, in the video that you just saw, students were sort of working on animations, picking sites. They would go visit the site themselves and take pictures. Um, and then my job was to um, take video and to produce the sort of larger film that we made as a studio. So I pimped my ride um, with a camera and some equipment and drove around town and filmed. Um, and kind of, you know, shot video from this moving, um, you know, cine vehicle is what I ended up kind of thinking about it. And then composed the, the soundtrack for this on, on an, the empty garage of the TTU architecture department building. And that's me running to a falling camera. So it was a, a, one, a one woman show. Um, so, you know, that was maybe the kind of first exercise in sort of thinking about um, ways of investigating and, and speculating through, through mi mixed media and really time-based media. Um, I'm, I'm gonna jump a little bit into the studio that I just taught at MIT. The sound studio um, was in the spring of 2022. And in the studio, in the studio we really um, wanted to shift the focus, or I keep saying we, and really we is me. Uh, me, my, me, me. Um, I wanted to shift the focus towards thinking about sound and architecture. Um, and in that mode, uh, not only thinking about the relationship that maybe has been there all along, but how can we heighten that relationship and begin to apply audio technologies to architectural representation. So um, we focused on audio-focused building interventions on sites near or around the traditional territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We considered site and landscape as narrative mediums. In the same way that we think of museums, galleries, monuments, and archives as vessels of knowledge, and many times incomplete vessels of knowledge, we will equally acknowledge that the stories that exist outside of them are just as important and if not more important. We will inquire into the existence of counter narratives in the land around us that require new forms of interpretation, display, and communication. So this was the, the call of the studio, right? The studio was divided into um, explorations and, and learning how to make uh, soundscapes and to think about soundscape ecology, to think about oral history, digital materiality, and alongside that, learn about the int integration of audio technologies. Um, so that meant, you know, wiring, soldering, literally learning how to make speakers. Um, but of course, it's an architecture studio, so we start with drawing. So we started with, with drawing and thinking of drawings as live instruments. Um, so students learned how to um, kind of work with digital synthesizers, begin to apply different rule sets um, or even kind of um, effects to a line, right? So line annotation became vessels for sound. And so we, we almost thought about um, reviews as moments of playing a drawing and the vignette as a kind of cinematic tool to zoom in to moments of a drawing and activate or um, kind of listen in to different parts of the drawing. Um, so we spent a lot of the, the semester drawing and then thinking about the translation of these drawings into models that would not only be models, but speakers, right? Loudspeakers for the stories of the sites that each student had chosen. 
Um, we had the amazing Nicholas Shalopov join us, who is um, a, a sort of audio interface designer um, and, and has made a lot of sort of audio-based objects and tools and who taught us how to, you know, literally solder and wire these things. And students entered, really kind of shifted from a sort of drawing sound making and maybe even kind of music composition space to production, fabrication, and making. Um, and really it was about kind of exploring materiality, the effect of resonance, vibration on materials, and how do you make a thing that actually works, right? So a lot of the hope that I had in the studio was that students would take these things, not that they would prize them forever as prized possessions, but that the models could go home and work, right? They could live years later at some party blasting Frank Ocean's future album that may or may not ever come out, but the model will be there, hopefully ready for that. Party. Okay. So some examples of students kind of playing with their models. So we exchanged the final review for um, a listening party and thought about the each model as also integrating um, live play. So you could go and play with each model, pull out parts. Um, other people had um, sort of, uh, projects had um, sort of touch enabled or touch sensor sound activation. Here's some, some of the resulting models, but um, as I said, we kind of exchanged the final review for uh, a listening party. And the listening party had um, five channels. We had five channels, so each speaker became a channel. And when one person played their album, all speakers became available to channel different perspectives of sound, right? So in some way, every model was a communal model for the studio or a communal sound uh, source of sound. And um, these were the amazing students who were, who were a part of the, the studio. And um, these are the, you know, ultimately we kind of exchanged um, a final review for a party, which felt fitting for the first semester kind of back in, in person. And now with the kind of final project that I wanted to talk about today, which is a project that I'm currently have been working and, and working on and developing as part of my fellowship at MIT. Um, and a project that is now kind of developing into a site responsive uh, sound installation that will be a part of exhibit Columbus in 2023. Um, the project is called Recordar, and this is its current state. It's a mess of stuff, um, thoughts and things. Um, this is literally like a pile of all of the kind of things that I've been thinking about. Um, Recordar is the name of a 16 channel sound system that I've been uh, kind of thinking and pondering about. It'll have 16 points of being able to input sound and 16 points of output and hopefully maybe even double or three times that in terms of output. Um, it's a recording system and it's a broadcasting system simultaneously that's built into a super scale table. And the, the table in a lot of ways has been something that I've been thinking a lot about and I, and I think it provides a lot of space for thinking about being together, right? The kind of table as a, as a place where we come together to do many things amongst which is eat um, and argue and uh, talk and enjoy and party and make decisions and write laws and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? The table is a kind of platform for activity and for action, um, I think is one thing that has, it has always been really interesting to me. Um, and, I, you know, th this drawing, I think, is one that I, I encountered very early in my architecture education, and it continues to be interesting to me. Now, no longer as a drawing in and of itself, but as an outline for the collapsing of time and the collapsing of event. And for me, sound can do that, 
literally, and, and can do that in conversation with space. So this project takes a kind of sound system and the ability to record, splits it amongst eight towers that sit around a touch-enabled um, tabletop, and participants will be able to sit at this table, hold conversations, and choose when and when, when to activate the recording system and when to turn off the recording system. And so in, the, the table will also have a, um, a unique transcription software. So it'll produce these kind of micro, um, rec not only sound recordings, but micro written transcriptions, right? And participants will live edit or in some ways communally edit what gets recorded and what gets documented and what doesn't. And so the, the kind of communal navigation of what gets recorded and what doesn't has always been, I think, a very kind of fascinating way of thinking about how we as a, as a group can make things, um, but also the space of the table being one that has to constantly be communally navigated. So um, this project has been in developing and, and you know, it's kind of something that's like in flux. So I, I, wa I wanted to sort of end it there with, um, I'm gonna end it with a video of the, of the model. Um, and the model uh, you'll see is, is, is made of hardwood. Um, the final table, the final kind of objects are going to be quite tall. Each, each um, seat is thought of more as a throne. And we'll have around three sources of sound from which um, vibrations as well as sound will emanate, right? So you'll feel some of the sound and also hear some of the sound. Um, and then the whole thing will be charred. So part of it will be to take it to exhibit Columbus in 2023 and stage it and sort of burn all of the surface of it while also recording the burn and then letting that come back as an underlying soundscape that emanates from the table um, when it's kind of sat on its site. So I'll kind of end it with that video and we can think a little bit about it. What you'll see is the kind of early experiments of a sensor system. Recordar is a feedback uh, sound system. So it's a looping sound system and it continually layers and layers and layers from each of the vantage points that it records at. Um, so you can kind of, you'll hear some of that in two different uh, methods in the video.
The Uruguayan writer Eduardo Galeano wrote the incredible one-sentence provocation that gave way to the system, the recording system, Recordar. He writes, Recordar, to remember from the Latin records, to pass back through the heart. This is what this project aims to do. We will pass some history, immediate history and deep history, back through the heart, and there allow the heart to skip a beat or to break or to mend. Thank you.